Good morning. Thank you for being here this morning for our, I, I believe, what amounts to being our first really uh, subject presentation on the LGBTQ welcoming uh, educational sort of spectrum. Uh, remember the first presentation we made some time ago was on the topic of graceful engagement. Graceful engagement. Uh, and that's the frame for all of these presentations. Um, the concept of graceful engagement is that uh, these are we're not trying to indoctrinate or convince or debate issues in these forums. What we're trying to do is present some information that gives us an opportunity to enter into a conversation to hear uh, where people are. Um, and uh, and in all of the, what I guess I would call potentially controversial, potentially divisive kinds of issues like LGBTQ welcoming, uh, that's the approach we want to take. Uh, uh, not to try to convince people to change their minds, but to engage in a conversation, a dialogue that allows us to hear where, uh, where we are. Where different people are, uh, as we're able to express uh, our opinions and be heard, uh, I think we find that we're, you know, if we can take seriously what other people think, uh, they're willing to take seriously what we think, and in that way, we begin to seek the truth together. Um, so that's the process. Um, Today, uh, James Keene is going to uh, make a presentation on uh, pronouns and terminology. Uh, next week, Rick Pollard is going to make a presentation on the concept of the gender spectrum. Uh, these are really important concepts for us to wrap our heads around. And if you're like me, that's like a foreign language. Um, our first sort of thought about encountering people who speak a foreign language is often they should speak my language. <laughs> uh, that, that's sort of a, often a gut reaction. Uh, but there's a lot to be gained by learning another person's language and letting them learn your language. And that's sort of what we're doing here. Is we're trying to learn a new language. Uh, so it takes time. There's going to be some resistance, uh, some uh, uh, dissonance, um, uh, intellectual dissonance. But uh, I ask you to listen and to, to let that sit and to think about these things. And then, to the extent that you're able, interpret them to other people in ways that other people can hear begin to understand, because each of you is a representative in this congregation. Each person here has a re responsibility not only to wrestle with these things, but to represent, uh, to try to uh, take some of the information you hear out and to engage in conversation with your neighbors, uh, especially other members of the congregation as we move forward in this process. But I want to thank James for take responsibility for this part of it. And thank you for being here uh, to engage in this important work. Thanks, Dr. for framing it. Um, I will simply add to this. This is part of an initiative in place today, Are We a Welcoming Church. And right now the focus is on LGBTQ, but it actually will, will branch out into other areas as well, which is where we're starting. And as this title indicates, we're going to be talking about changing pronouns and other gender-based language. Um, so the, the focus is on the language that we use, the language that the community uses both for itself and to describe itself. Um, this can be informal. I'm going to talk about language in general, 
and then we're going to be talking about the pronouns, which are very difficult for some people, and then we're going to talk about the definitions, which while they should not be difficult to understand, they do tend to confuse a lot of people because there's a lot of crossover in the language. I will start by telling you there is no universal definition for a lot of LGBTQ terminology. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about them as umbrella terms. Okay, um, and, and an example, there are lots of examples in here. And if you really need to stop me, please wave your hand and raise your hand. So, get started. <laughs> Oh, goodness. There we go. So, the focus of our discussion we're talking integration of the LGBTQ community into mainstream America, and it represents a major change to our culture. Um, so all, most of us in this room, there's a few younger folks who may not have been born here in the 40s and 50s, but many of us were. Um, this was a taboo subject. So, for it to be happening today is just in some ways quite extraordinary. It is important to acknowledge that culture change often takes place very slowly. Like there are stops and there are starts. Sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. Significant culture changes that impact religious beliefs, sexual mores and practices and social norms are particularly challenging. And the integration of LGBT culture and language is impacting all three. It's the trifecta. <laughs> now, as we move through the presentation, it's important to remember that there is no universal agreement, as I mentioned, and there are numerous nuances. And I'm not going into all the possible nuances, we're going to be here all day. Okay, again, I'm looking at this at a at sort of a hot level. Additionally, when I talk about sex, I'm referring to biology. And when we talk about gender, it's a social construct. Right? More on that as we go through. So it's generally understood that words change their meaning over time, um, and it's impacted uh, by lots of factors. Certainly in this country, again, if you grew up here, you know that there are regional dialects. There are words that mean something in one place, but they're not well understood someplace else. Right? And Lisa's not here today, I was going to ask her about this. The first time I went to Newport, Rhode Island, 1970, so we're talking over 50 years ago, <clears throat> my brother was at OCS, and we went to lunch at, at Howard Johnson, and I ordered a chocolate milkshake. But what did I get? A glass of chocolate milk. That's right. <laughs> and, and, and you I got a frat. Like, no, 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 <laughs> frat is what we call it. Right, yeah, it's a cabinet there. And I called the waitress and said, I ordered a milkshake. She goes, well, that's what you got, honey. <laughs> I said, oh, there ice cream. Oh, oh, I have it. Now, do they use it today? I, I don't know. Probably not. I think they call it a crap. Well, well, with the corporation of McDonald's and fast food everywhere, everybody knows what a chocolate milkshake is. Right? But there are other euphemisms out there. Like y'all is said very commonly. The further south you go, it's all in y'all, right? Oh, y'all, you go to Pennsylvania and you get unions and unions. This makes no sense to me. Use that. Use guys. Yeah. You go to northern Minnesota and they say, what's that? Right? <laughs> well, what does it mean? Whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> <laughs> English, and especially American English, is considered a highly fluid language. Okay? New words are constantly being created. I worked for Verizon for 35 years. Verizon is a made up word. Right? It's just, it's just, if the bell system was collapsing. Is we need a new name for the company, let's try this. They do marketing research to see how people react to words. All the healthcare stuff is on TV today, right? You can't even pronounce the words. And half my family, I think, maybe I live in London, and they always ask me, my one sister all the time, what do you want? And then she says, forget it. The name doesn't mean anything <laughs> over there. And, and, and that's true. Um, much of the change is driven by new technology, marketing, but also culture change. And I've listed the social media and the internet. Facebook, text, and similar communication tools. And if you've raised teenagers, you know they make up their own language. And I often think it's to torture us so that we don't know exactly what it is they're saying. <laughs> now, the Oxford English Dictionary, if you're familiar with that, they do they evaluate words every year. They do research out there, what's what's uh, what's common, what's not, and then they approve, which is sort of a joke word, to add new words to the dictionary. 
because there is no legal requirement for anybody to approve words that we use. We make them up, we use them, and they determine if they're common language or not. Now, if they're not, they'll often put non-standard behind the definition and they include them. Um, and and I, I had to list my one or three folks. It's the use of less or fewer today. If there are 100 people in the room and 50 leave, there are 50 fewer people. And what you will hear is it's 50 less people. And that's based on research that say people react better to the word less than the fewer. And, and the other favor is here with all of this. It's wrote, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, when people say, I, I feel bad, that doesn't mean I feel bad. <laughs> but who controls the meaning of language? Efforts to modify language and change the meaning of words you see is not new. I mentioned back in the 1700s, authors of mystery novels were trying to find a way not to reveal the identity of the protagonist or the, or the murderer or whoever it is. But they, they really couldn't come up with that thing. But it was really one of the first gender neutral efforts made. We also have art, music, books, and uh, both formal and informal words for the vernacular. I mentioned the Kama Sutra, and that was back in the third century that had sexual terms to the vocabulary that a lot of people were asking about. Men are still gasping about this. <laughs> and yet it's calm. It's nothing compared to a lot of stuff that's available today. So even today, we often struggle to gain a common understanding. And I referenced the Harry Potter series. When it first came out, the books came out of London. It was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. They didn't get <coughs> Americans to figure that out. So they gave Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And they changed all the language. They thought we were too dense to understand the car park or the parking lot. <laughs> okay. So they rewrote the book. The other is, and, and I can criticize them because of the part of the family. They, most of the literature in this country is written in the 10th grade. Most of it there is written in the 12th grade. Okay. So they're very aware of it. I hear it all the time. Are you folks smart enough to figure this out? <laughs> <laughs> However, the cost of converting it drove them to, they figured out we really could handle it. And all the future volumes were in Greek and English. So if you take the time to study with me, so here are some examples of English words that have either changed meaning or the definition. And I've listed some. Let me focus on some. Um, I'm just this, softening us up here. Yeah, I am. <laughs> You're ready. Miss or Mrs. Until the feminist movement in the 1960s, Miss or Mrs. was the most common use. Um, and then what did we get? Ms. Right? Very common. And it, for a lot of people, it was, oh gosh, well, I don't like it. You don't like it, so this thing, that's okay. That's okay. But it became common, and, and, and it's still in use today. And it's not, I realize it's not gender related, but it talks about marriage status, doesn't it? Many women felt it was none of your business if they were married, so they went with Ms. And of course, in the beginning, the assumption was you're hiding, you're not really married, you just don't want to say this. Today, Ms. is used primarily for girls, if, if you see something in press. The other change from Mrs. was it used to be for my wife, she would have been Mrs. James Dean. Right? She took her husband's name. Now she said, well, what she wants. <laughs> to hook up. It used to be hooked up your washing machine, but now <laughs> it's just an engaging casual sex. Okay, it's a hook up culture. We hear this all the time. And actually, with um, COVID, that's diminished some, which is good. <laughs> My favorite, though, was diet. If you're an electrician, it's a diagonal wire cutter. Okay? You know, get handy the diet. Folks are going to take a couple of them. It's also a term used for lesbian. And it's around here, it's an upper class movie. <laughs> I'm going to see my dyke. And let me tell you, you see first year parents with their kid here, and he says, I've got to talk to my dyke. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they pull out the rat Bible and they show mom and dad that it's okay. <laughs> um, rubber used to be a flexible material to make a condom. Um, when thong first came out, you wore thongs or flip flops to the pool. Now it's a type of underwear that they advertise at the moment. Um, gay. In the 1930s, if you said I was gay, it would be I was a happy go lucky guy. Right? Today, it's someone sexually attracted to a person of the same gender. And it is a, it is a broad term. I'm going to get into the greater detail of that in a minute. 
John <laughs> is from an incident at an airport about 20 years ago. I don't know if you recall this. There was a 20-something young man who, res who resented a body pat down following on him. He said, no, you're not going to do it. They said, you want me to get on the flight? Yeah, we'll go through a body pat down. And he said, okay, but don't touch my junk. <laughs> and they did. And he's, he decked the guy. Down he went. And it spread around the world to this. Don't touch my junk. The table will come, will come, come for people. <laughs> Probably one of the biggest is marriage. A legal relationship between a man and a woman, but today between two adults, regardless of gender. So let's jump over to changing pronouns now. All right, to recognize this movement, gender identities beyond male and female, is growing primarily in Western Europe and the United States. This isn't necessarily a worldwide phenomenon, um, but it's certainly prevalent here. And in the pronouns that people use, you see such as she and he and they, are commonplace today. There are efforts either to eliminate them, but actually more of an emphasis to a standard. And part of the challenge is that we start talking French, Italian, Spanish. The words are male or female, or feminine or masculine. And so it isn't a matter of he or she being the first. It's how do you restack that language to eliminate that? And that's going to be a challenge. Okay. Now, I mentioned sex is about a person's biology. It describes their chromosomal makeup, their hormones, their anatomy. The gender, in contrast, is a social construct to describe the person's understanding of themselves. Um, most of us, when we were growing up, there would have been a woman or a girl rather in the neighborhood who didn't want to wear dresses, didn't want to wear high heels, dressed like a boy. What would we have called it? Right. Again, it's, you know, they say what's really new? The answer is sometimes not as much. Now, we also need to acknowledge that biology can be hidden from public view. Your junk can be emphasized in a more seen way. And it's important to note that there is significant pushback on the use of alternative pronouns from some sectors in the literature. Um, some resist because of the confusion. Uh, the first time I read an obituary in the Washington Post, it was like Cindy Jones or something, and it kept saying, they, 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 and I'm like, I missed something. Is there a second name missing? Did somebody else die? Right. But you do get used to it. You start seeing it. You're more likely to see it in major metropolitan areas, right? Or urban areas where this has become more of an issue than in rural areas. Um, however, some believe that using non gender specific or preferred pronouns will become difficult. And they're quite adamant. And I have with me, I don't know if I have time to go into it. There's a lot going on in the legal field right now in the state legislatures. Florida being one, Ohio this week, did some ugly stuff down there in, in terms of a pushback on this issue. It's unbiblical, and they say, simply put, God created men and women, and those identities are not changeable or interchangeable. Okay. Now, science might tell us something else, but we'll get for that. So, a gender neutral and gender inclusive pronoun is a pronoun which does not associate gender with an individual person. Uh, some languages that I mentioned, such as English, do not have gender neutral or gender um, pronoun as part of the vernacular. And so you find people struggling, what do I replace he, his, or she, her, or what is it? Um, and an example of this challenge can be found when addressing gay marriage. Because most often today, when you meet uh, a gay couple, two men, how do they introduce my partner? Not his partner, because that doesn't indicate that I'm married. I, in fact, the opposite. Partner suggests you haven't been. So, how do they introduce it? How do you introduce it? Spouse. Spouse would be non gender, right? But often, right? And why do they do that? Because it's a, it's a double message. This is my life partner. Um, and it's also a way, a way of identifying themselves as part of the LGBTQ community. If you say spouse, you don't know. So, there's some value right now in communicating. Um, because they're not part of the vernacular in most cases, attempts have been made to create neutral, pro, uh, neutral pronouns. Um, and, and the confusion is a problem. Uh, there's all kinds of things online to tell you how to determine what order to use and how to use it. However, to a large degree, it doesn't work because of indifference. 
And I'm not saying that is negatively to the sound. It's a lot of work to start incorporating new language into your everyday existence. It's a lot of trouble. So people say, well, call yourself as if you want, use they, and, and I do mention they, they is probably the most successful. People are adjusting to that. Like for a lot of for a lot of folks, it's just like, you know, leave me alone. Call yourself whatever you want. So here's some examples. Hey, right, there it is. Um, and again, if you go online, there'll be all, all kinds of sentences how to use SID supposedly. And any of these words, they're awkward. Language changes are awkward. However, these are like the big three. They then theirs, you then zero, and then the okay. And as you can see, the, the last one has been around at least since 1983, but in fact, it was an indication of I mentioned a lot of this stuff is not just easy. taking the consonants off of those. Yes, <laughs> to make them gender neutral. Right. Now, this was actually some progress. This is I use Pew Research a lot. You can see growing share of U.S. who know someone who is transgender or goes by gender neutral pronouns. In 2017, it was 37 percent. Last year, it's up to 32 percent, and it goes by gender neutral pronouns. 2018 and 18% up to 26. Now, what this data doesn't tell us is that when I know one person who's used it, or do you find it common? Is it, is it part of your everyday experiences? It still, show, it still shows progress in the integration of that LGBTQ So let's get into some definitions. What does LGBTQ stand for? And it's an acronym for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. That is the most common acronym. Um, people in this country seem okay with the acronyms. And I grew up in DC where we have dictionaries for acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Billy works for EPA and Susie works for FAA and the right. Yeah, you need to learn. What does LGBTQIA plus stand for? Again, that umbrella acronym, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, pansexual, and the plus is for all other gender or sexual orientation that matters. Now, there are variations that add or subtract to this acronym, which is when it becomes confusing. If you add a two and an S in the front, as an example, it means you have two spirit, both male and female. But two spirit is a is a designation in Native American. Well, it is, but it's also the, the analogy I would make is I have an Irish Catholic father and an English Anglican mother, and I claim both. I'm not English and Irish. Many people in this country, so they're simply claiming I have two spirit. You know, okay. It's not as false to mark as people like to make. Now, if you add a second Q, it represents someone who's questioning their sexual identity. So what does it mean to be homosexual? First of all, it's not exactly a new term, um, but when most people have heard it. It's a romantic attraction, sexual attraction, or sexual behavior between members of the same sex or gender. And this goes back to the person's sense of their identity, okay? It was first used, you can see, by Karl Avia Kirkman, a Hungarian journalist, who wrote passionately in opposition to Germany's anti-sodomy laws of what does it mean to be a lesbian? Usually, a woman whose primary sexual and affectional orientation is toward other men. However, some non binary people who still are between the world groups of women also do that. And by the way, if you want copies of these, um, we can email you if you want to select if you want that. I accept. Okay. <laughs> what does it mean to be gay? Broadly, it represents a sexual or affectional orientation toward people of the same gender. However, increasingly, it is used to describe males. You have lesbian women, you have gay, gay males, okay? But it actually is a broad term. If you were to say to people, I'm, I'm dealing with the gay community, it would be inclusive. They would not say only males. They would, they would tend to be like the broader community. But increasingly, as I said, it's, it's being used to refer to. Now, 
this is a challenge before us right now. What does it mean to be a transsexual? It's an adjective used most often in an umbrella term. It's now abbreviated to trans, you know, from that, from trans. And identify as someone who identifies as transgender means that their internal knowledge of their gender is different from conventional or cultural expectations based on the sex that was assigned to them. And we hear lots of discussion on the news about this. Billy now becomes, I assume, Susan B wants to become Billy. And it's a complicated process. Um, and we're going to get into more some of the trans, transgender surgeries and things that are going to get interested in. So I've given an example. A transgender person may refer to, to a woman who was assigned male at birth or a woman who was assigned female at birth, but they today identify with the opposite. We see this, again, it's not uncommon. It is also, however, an umbrella term that describes <coughs> someone who identifies as gender other than female or male. And if, if that kind of throws you, all I can say is that's different. Okay. That's often referred to as non binary. So the term trans is used rather than transgender, as I mentioned, um, and it's for non conforming non binary people. However, such declarations can significantly affect social inclusion. And we know about this. There are lawsuits all over this country. I love a student who says, I'm no longer Billy, I'm Susie. But I want to use the, the, the girls' restroom and all, all health issues. But you're not doing it until you have um, surgery and legally become that's not going to happen across the country. In some cases, the student has won, in many cases, they have not. Part of the problem though becomes they are socially ostracized by people who are adamantly in opposition to this. It's a tough decision to make. No one should assume that a kid is making this kind of declaration. Just not out there. Are we okay? Now, we're going to spend a little more time on this. What does it mean to be intersex? It's an umbrella term to describe a wide range of natural body variations. Intersex. Chromosome composition, hormone concentration, and external and internal characteristics. Now, it's that most visibly intersex people are mutilated in the pregnancy. And I'll get into some statistical data in just a minute. By doctors. By doctors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because doctors have often been taught they have to make it, they have to make a determination. <laughs> That's okay. Now, I do say that people are not uncommon. Uncommon, although society's denial of their existence has allowed very little room for this issue to be discussed. And this is this is the issue. You give birth. What's the first thing mom and dad? Boy or girl. girl. Boy or girl. Like, and a legal de determination. Because they got to know what color clothes they are. Yeah, or to tell people, I have a son, I have a daughter. Right, here it is. It's a common <clears> question. <throat> However, and we're going to discuss this whole issue next week. We're all born on a sliding scale when it comes to sex, okay? And the, you can look at it this way 100% female here, whatever that means, 100% male here. And there's this great wide area in between. And the last data is somewhat interesting. And it's a bell curve. It's a bell curve, yes. Um, the double bell curve. Now, most are born, are easily identified as male and female. However, <coughs> every one and every 1,000 newborns have an ambiguous, ambiguous gender. And that's research from the Mayo Clinic. Now, that may not seem like much. Multiply that with our whole country. It's a lot of people who are born. And a lot of it is they simply haven't fully developed. You know, the doctor here can tell us maybe some of that. Has, have, you been, have you encountered any of that with, with children? As in where that is? Yeah. I mean, you say it with your practice. No, no. No, no, no. Most, most, say no. Answer most, most would say no, they don't really encounter it. It's yeah. Other other research says it's. Oh, I've read that it's uh, in the range of two percent, which is about the frequency of redhead, uh, natural redhead. I want to read a great book about this topic, Galileo's Middle Finger. Is the name Galileo Middle Finger. Now, other research I've read is like one out of every person. The point is, this is a reality. 
Um, and we now know it's only the first question in these cases. <coughs> Extensive research has revealed that babies are born who are genetically male, but appear to be female. You know, folks, and I mentioned here, that all the eggs start as female. There's a change that gets made. It doesn't get made in the way you think it should. It can come out um, ambiguous is the best word to use. Uh, and again, sometimes they develop more fully, but often surgery is done right away. And any disruption to these tests that determine the sex of the fetus can result in a mismatch between the appearance of the external genitals and the internal sex organ. Real case, twins born in, what did they have? I believe it must have been the second, no more. And during the circumcision, a newly trained physician cut off the glands of the penis and then removed it. What to do about it? Well, John Hopkins at that time was the forefront of doing the penis science of surgery. So they decided to make pins out of Is it Daniel? Yes. And so he became an early life, a girl, a girl, a lot of resistance. I mean, they didn't have it when he used to make it. Right. Just resistance. And Just oh, raised him as a girl. Talking about when you were a teenager, you know, you're not going to be able to have kids, but you can adopt. They did everything that they thought was going to to do. He became increasingly belligerent, and they finally said, they told him the truth. Here's what it is. He started living life as a, as a male, angry, and committed suicide until he killed himself. What they didn't realize is just because the outside says boy or girl, it doesn't mean the inside says the same thing. And by the way, after that, Johns Hopkins stopped doing the gender reassignment surgery for a while, and they're now the people who are going to do it. <clears throat> so what does it mean to be asexual? This is actually a fairly easy one, even though it says it's a broad spectrum of sexual orientation. A lot of it is you're just not into sex and sexual feelings and what have you, but again, you're on a scale, okay? But basically, and, and I wanted to make the difference between celibacy, um, you're a Catholic, um, right, you have you pledged celibacy. It doesn't mean that well, I'm we're all celibate until we're married. I need to tell you something. <laughs> 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 okay. All right, this is a word that's popping up more frequently cisgender. It denotes a person whose sense of personal identity and gender correspond with their birth sex. So most people in this room, not all, would be cisgender. Right? I'm born a male, I identify as a male. Okay? Um, however, it's often used as the opposite of transgender. Um, I, I, I'm hearing a lot more, I'm not sure why. Uh, perhaps it's people's need to identify, to find a slot to fit, fit themselves into. Um, bisexual. Again, a term that's been around for ages. A person's primary sexual and affectionate orientation is towards people of the same or other gender, or towards people regardless of their gender. And this is one where there's often a lot of slang and language thrown around. It. It's not just that they will have sex with male or men or women, not have sex with anyone who moves, is what it's said. It's disrespectfully said. In fact, it's just an orientation. What does it mean to be gender expansive? An, um, an umbrella term? For people who want to broaden cultures, commonly have a different definition of gender. They're often just recognized, um, particularly by high school, as the rebel. Somebody says, I don't want to be cataloged, I don't want to be Jesus S. And so they can be all over the place. Um, they're not always easy people to live with. Now, non binary, I mentioned earlier, a gender identity and experience that embraces the full universe of expression and a way of being. That resonates to an individual. So you go beyond male or female. Um, this is actually fairly common on college campuses today. Students go through a period of time where they say, I'm not binary. Again, it's perhaps a rebellion, part of self identification. It may absolutely be doing what they want, um, but it's a time of exploration. When I counsel students, I often tell them, You got four years here to figure out who you are, separate from mom and dad. And non binary <coughs> comes up. Conversation. Why do I have to be? And you don't. You don't. But I don't know that you're ready to talk about it. Back. Keep keep about that. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And Rick, again, we're going to. What does it mean to be on the spectrum? A spectrum is a range of sliding scale. It means to be all of this. 
Yes, and we, we all are. I'm sure you're going to say that, right? All of it? Yes. For example, it says with sexual orientation, the attraction of men, women, or someone other, of another gender all exist on separate spectrums. You might be attracted to men, you might be. It, 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 it goes all over the place, and I'll leave the details to the students. And what is genderism? It's discrimination based on gender, especially discrimination against women. We get this up a lot, right? The sense of discrimination. It's a belief that one gender is superior to the other, and throughout most of history, two is one time. And um, I didn't mention when we were looking at terms of man or mankind that we find in the book of prayer, we find in the Bible, and it was intended to include everybody. But increasingly, there's dissatisfaction, and different words to describe the total population. I, I don't want to be labeled just man. Now, there's lots of definitions I could throw up here. There were like small groups of people. Uh, again, I was focusing on mm -hmm. uh, umbrella terms. But let's look at what's normal, what's new, and what's not. I would argue human behavior may not have changed that much over time. We tend to view this as a radical change to our culture and what it might be. It doesn't necessarily represent a change in human behavior since time began. Murder started in. The, one of the best uh, studies to read on this topic is John Boswell's uh, study of uh, uh, homosexuality and truth. Uh, he studies uh, the reality of homosexuality throughout uh, basically history, history and shows when. For many years, the church broadly accepted and embraced uh, different genders, different sexual orientations, but that that largely changed in the 13th, 14th century. Mm -hmm. And there's very little evidence to suggest why. But he has a theory. But John Boswell wrote, wrote, wrote this in 86. It's really a study of Sunday. But the, and part of the reason we know this is if you read the Hebrew Bible, there's lots of thou shalt not. And you don't generally say thou shalt not if it's, if it's not happening. Okay? So it goes in there. And I've looked at some ancient laws, and um, Henry VIII, 1533, had Parliament passed legislation out on the um, And it remained illegal until 1967. Which means the law wasn't there before it. Not, not a universal law. But I also know that it only went in, it only affected um, in 1967, then over 21, England and Wales, it didn't affect Scotland, Northern Ireland, Channel Islands, it didn't affect All that changed in the 19, in the 1990s, 2000. And today the UK is considered a progressive society okay, as it relates to homosexual population. That doesn't suggest there isn't discrimination, okay? But at least legally, there's a freedom there. And while it is important to acknowledge that from a historical perspective, this increase in acceptance has happened quickly, it is fairly recent, but it is not universal. Okay. As I've said, this is a Western Europe, um, European, American, Canadian, probably Australian, New Zealand, but it's not the same in, in Iran or India or Russia. There's lots of places where this is not the norm. But it is real. And for many people, it is a radical change that needs to be challenged. Well, there's many indigenous cultures where it's always been there. Well, we know about the early Greek uh, Olympics in the news. And I, uh, I, I shouldn't have given that on the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> now, the change in acceptance can also be attributed in part to the work done by Kinsey in the 1940s and 50s. Okay. The reports on human sexual behavior shocked people, but it also enlightened them. And unfortunately, he relied heavily on volunteers. So a lot of his findings were challenged later by Baxter and Johnson and said, you didn't quite get this right. And, and one of the most common ones is, your frequency of intercourse in the matter. Well, people lie. <laughs> By the 1970s, you could say, oh, every day, every morning, that's what we start right now. That's <laughs> what yeah, you, must, you must be living a different life than I am. <laughs> right. All right. The other is we're familiar with the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, in part probably by the introduction of birth control pills. 
And there, there is a direct correlation between in, uh, in, um, developing uh, birth control pills and an increase in sexual relations across the board. Uh, drugs have a lot to do with that too. <laughs> but, so the feminist movement, I mentioned the Ms. and Mrs. Wright, but it was uh, I am woman, hear me roar, right? And we can do everything, but also liberation events, such as the Stonewall Riot in New York City, you can think of the that in June of 1969. The gay community in this case largely you know, said had enough of this BS and they fought back. Right? And it changed the world, it changed the country. Yeah. But it's also, I mentioned Masters and Johnson. They published extensively on human sexuality. Their books are still read. They were married. They since split up. They were women before. Um, and it talked about things people either simply had rejected as untrue. Um, cross dressing clubs. I don't know if you've heard of cross dressing clubs. They're in all 50 states. They are men overwhelmingly heterosexual. They love to dress up in women's clothes. And until COVID, they had an annual. They're called fraternity. I don't like it. Okay. I, I don't have a clothes wear already, right? But but they do. And again, it's it's important to remember they're heterosexual for the most part. This is not this is not some like drag queen. People will say they're a bunch of drag queens. No, they are not. This is a whole different animal as well. Gay bars, most people know they exist. Um, and news camps, that's another one. That uh, my neighbor, when I was growing up, got some news camp magazine and he was going to show it. And his kids would see it so he could all look at it. And even then, I kept thinking, who wants to play tennis with no clothes on? <laughs> 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 Not you. Not, Not me. me. <laughs> well, first of all, this Irish English skin burns in that And I'll say, what do you mean by bottom burns? All this stuff, like poor stuff. No, <laughs> We're sexual beings, and indications are that we're going to remain that way. But some of it's hidden. Um, personal experience, Darling and I, I, I think most of you know working in Africa for 20 something years. She came up and we went to see the Book of Mormon, which, if you saw it, now oh, it's a little in your face. Right? <laughs> so the woman next to us, um, I have a year old, but she's by herself. And Darlene, having gone to college in uh, Minnesota, is that a Minnesota accent? And she goes, no, no, no. She was from Bismarck, Minnesota. And she was in New York with a choir group from the high school in Bismarck, Minnesota. And Darlene and I both asked, You brought high school kids from Bismarck, Minnesota to see this? Oh, no, she says. They're off to see the Lion King. I didn't know anybody down here. I can't remember where you seen the Lion King. There's someone on your way. St. John is tomorrow. I can give you tickets. Wow, this was great. We went to, as we're leaving the theater, she says, Now remember, I wasn't here last <laughs> night. <laughs> so no, no, there's that hidden side of life because we are all sexual beings. Mm -hmm. Questions? Mm -hmm. Questions. 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 I'm trying to stay real careful. Questions. This seems to be a more it's easy to follow. It's trying to communicate and interact with others in which the uh, terminology is very fluid, extremely fluid, and changing constantly for a person who's not fully into that, you're going to make a mistake. I mean, you just do it wrong. Yes, so that's a possibility. That's almost inevitable. <laughs> so, at least for me personally, it's going to be inevitable. And so uh, that means that kind of right I'm very confident. You and the other, the purpose of the presentation it is not um, to indicate moral or acceptance or rejection. It's about education, about when somebody says, I'm non-binary, you know what it is they're trying to communicate to you, okay? Or someone says, I'm gay, or yeah, I'm intersex, or whatever. And to understand how complicated we really are, we, we 
we are not this easy black and white that we would like. We really are not just trans people. There's a whole lot, and I don't want to steal what you're trying to say. No, you can't. I'll believe you. But in many ways, it's like race or culture. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, more language is then. If you go into a foreign country and you try to speak their culture, Experience working in Europe a lot has been that if you at least make some effort, right, they're okay. And and I actually feel okay when I'm Italian and Spanish and also not French. Um, the German, you know, there's 25 other words, you know, how do you say? So I want to say, you know, I can have a good spectrum from English and they say nine in conversation. They appreciate my making an effort. And that would be true with this culture as well. You're going to make an effort. Somebody may judge you on that, but it's probably. There's just a hesitation. I don't want to screw up here. I don't want to offend. No. We don't want to, we don't want to be more offended. Not trying to be. No, because there's certainly a lot of people who are trying to be terrible. So, right? Yeah. And you're afraid sometimes you're afraid to talk because you're afraid to make them say mm -hmm. you insult them. Okay. Sure. I think not only afraid to make mistakes, this is one of the private and sensitive issues that we all encounter, but it's probably in private. It's what happens in your home. If you're more sensitive in your bedroom. So to come together and talk about this would be amazing. It, it really is. Well, please don't. Please don't, please don't talk about what's going on. <laughs> That's not really what we're interested in. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what makes it so frightening and hard to deal with. It's a big barrier, but it's always in the background. It, it is, Don, and it's why, as I was constructing this, I wanted to make this academic, educational, right. versus getting terribly personal. But reality comes out. Yes, it does. And that's why it's a mistake, we don't know what to say, uh, it's hard to believe. If you grew up like I did in a, in a boy's prep school, then you're very familiar with boys using uh, sex and uh, uh, so on as a way to shame and belittle some boys, and you you know which side of that you want to be on, and so you carefully practice uh, making sure you're presenting yourself in a way that's not going to be belittled. It might not even be the way and I I don't think it's just a case of boys school. I mean, I think that that's probably true in, um, in many of the ways that we, many of us, grew up. Uh, we recognize how those tools of shame and belittlement were used to uh, educate us into the way that we should present and express ourselves. I, I mean, that's just my experience. You'll have to speak for yourself, but I suspect it's not just. Yes. Um, since you're here talking about words and definitions, thinking over the last 50 years, the word queer has certainly changed. Yes. I think multiple times. That's how I see it in print and novels and books. Uh, the newspaper is included in the LGBT. Um, in some ways, it seems to me it's redundant. I mean, isn't that sort of covered by all the other terms you talked about? And yet, it 
it's it's sort of come back in the forefront now as being an acceptable. Can you just at least say a little bit on where we are with that word? Yeah, it's interesting. I took that out of this presentation because I said that is so well known at this point. No, <laughs> so we're not going to sit here and there it is. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is. You're right. It, it, we were all were mostly growing up criticism of this slide. And then it started being used within the interview to cover the metaphor, saying LGBTQ community running and as, as a sexual identifier. But it's not widespread, it's not as well defined as, as the other ones that you mentioned earlier in that presentation. So it's it gone from what we all thought then was just this thing or queer. Um, and, and actually, it was a derogatory term to say something was queer. Even, even back in the 40s, 50s, it was still. And then it faded from you since so now it's going to come back. And we'll see where it goes. Uh, I believe it refers to a more fluid yes, ident it identification. So but it, it's very broad. Like you, you may some days identify one way and some days another way. So that your identification is not a fixed thing. Um, and the, the reality is that that's probably more true for many of us than we like to admit. It's not, you know, that that it, that we have we have movement within ourselves about how attracted or about we are to one sex or another or how we express ourselves. Uh, some days we feel a little bit more flamboyant, uh, or we dress a little bit more, you know, uh, male. Uh, some days we dress more female. Yeah. It's more for that tends to be the case with women than with men, but it's still true of men, like the clubs you're talking about. Yes, and, um, but but another example I'll throw out there is in the seventies and eighties. Um, again, working in New York, when men started wearing shirts and orange shirts. I call them orange and the women goes, oh, it's peach. No, it's same orange. <laughs> <laughs> but suddenly we were deemed metrosexuals. Right? Yeah, Again, it's a term true. that is faded from <laughs> use. And I will see where queer goes. Um, I, I'm just not sure at this point. As you said, it's kind of broad as what your career is. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, and, and I had earlier, this is not a done deal. Any culture change has Movement forward and movement back. Last week in Ohio, two laws were passed barring women and girls from participating, transgender women and girls from participating in high school and college sports. There was a high school um, ceremony Friday in a, in a city just north of Columbus where the speaker went on a tirade, an anti LGBTQ tirade, and people applauded. So, I mean, this is not a universal acceptance. And here in the lovely state of Virginia, um, a gentleman named Peter Bianco, I think is how you say his name, was fired because he refused to use gender neutral pronouns. He had agreed with the young lady who could call her uh, whatever name she wanted to be called, but that he wasn't his religious beliefs. Our attorney general was on his side, and he's saying this conflict between religion, um, with, with religious beliefs and religious freedom, is only going to grow. It's, and, and it's not hard to get around. And the further south you go, Florida is out of control um, right now on this issue. We can't even talk about what it is. They don't, don't say gay or gay. That's bad. But, so our focus is trying to become welcoming, inclusive. Uh, and this isn't a, an effort to, to brainwash anybody or say this is how you have to think. It's again to provide information for you to make those decisions about what in your life. But as a church, we do want to be inclusive. And, and that's the all we sign up. Recently, I've noticed some people in the signature element at the bottom will put a string of pronouns. What does that mean? I have not seen that. Oh, it's oh yeah. It's 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 well, yeah, I do it online. Yeah. So, so it's one way. It's one way that you try to uh, address this issue. Uh, the people will write their name and then they'll say their pronouns. So you, you may go to a meeting and people will ask you to identify your pronouns when, yeah, yeah. Uh, this happens in a lot of settings. Um, and you just say he, him, his, or uh, she, her, hers. 
Or they them. Yeah, they them. Yeah, I, I don't read they them there. There's a lot of indifference to this. So it's their area. People aren't paying attention to it. It is his way of communicating that. Um, he wants, I mean, this is part of any culture. This is mm -hmm. Does anybody have a grandchild who uh, is identified in, in, in some gender? Some different gender way of a child. I mean, I do. Um, many of us have children or nieces or nephews who are identifying differently than simply straight male, female. Yeah, you know, folks, we're in a time of transition, and there are always dangerous times. And mistakes will be made. And things will go left on Tuesday and right on Friday. Uh, and that it's again, it's part of the normal course of any culture that we can think of, not just one. Isn't it just about understanding and accepting other people where they are? Well, it could be, Carol, but that's two steps we just mentioned. Understanding is one, accepting is another. I think our objective here now is for people to understand how complex this issue is. And hope, hope they accept it. Yeah. But that is a second step. 